Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and praise the Lord. I'm excited to be here with you today at this very special time and moment. Coming in about five minutes early this afternoon, just to give everybody a chance to come on in. So we're going to start at 3 o'clock. I just came in at 2.55, and uh, we're going to get started here in about five minutes. Enjoy some music. I've got a word for you. I can't wait to preach today.
All right, guys, it's three o'clock. Welcome to Time of Transformation. I am excited today about the word of the Lord. I'm glad I started five minutes early, gave everybody a chance to get in here. We're going to get into the word of the Lord. Um, if you have your Bibles, I want you to start to turn them with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And I'm going to direct your attention to the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th verse. But before I do that, I want you to know, I talked about it earlier this week, and I'm going to quickly go through it. Uh, Time of Transformation is a ministry of Iglesia Trinidad. That's my church. That's my home church. We're under Pastors uh, Ramon and Sohi Galvez. Uh, we're located at 11,602 Bobcat Road here in Houston, Texas. If you don't have a home church, if you don't have a place to go, the reason I'm doing this is, is I'm doing this out of my home, but the reason I'm doing this is, is to connect you with the local church. I want you to be connected with something greater than yourself, just like I was able to get connected with something greater than myself, and it got me into the presence of the Lord. So, Iglesia Trinidad, 11,602 Bobcat Road here in Houston, Texas. We have services on Friday night at 7.30 p.m., Sundays at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., Wednesdays at 7.30, we have small groups, and then Saturdays at 7.30, uh, I do Celebrate Recovery at our church. That's a drug and alcohol program for folks who are recovering from uh, alcohol, drugs, and any kind of addiction issues. So uh, we want you to come. We want you to be blessed. I want you to tune in here every Sunday at 3 p.m., I'm bringing the word. I'm excited about what God's doing. Um, and I think, uh, oh, and then one more thing. This coming weekend, our church is having, uh, it's called the fin de semana con Dios, which means that's the weekend with God. And what that means is, is for the entire weekend, it's going to be like a lock-in. I don't know if when you were kids, you guys ever went to a lock-in, but it's going to be like a Holy Ghost lock-in. <laughs> And you're going to get, they're going to lock into the church. They're going to have dramas. They're going to have preaching. And from Friday night on into Sunday morning, they're going to spend the whole weekend in the presence of the Lord. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to call me. The service times are there in the description. My phone number is in the description. Uh, if you need anything or have questions about the Fin de Semana con Dios, the weekend with God, I want you to get with me or get with my wife. Uh, DM me, DM her, whatever you've got to do. I want everybody to be a part of that. I went to the last one and my life was blessed extremely. Uh, I was extremely blessed for having been there and done that. Let's get into the word of the Lord today. Second Corinthians chapter number four. And I'm going to read to you verses one through seven. I've got a, whew, I've got a powerful word today that the Lord uh, has, has put in my spirit this week. And I, I, you know, I'm going to tell you this for, for to be honest. Last week I planned to preach uh, a sermon. And I didn't preach it because I preached what I preached last week. And then this week I planned to preach that sermon. And then God changed it again for me to preach this sermon. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to preach that other sermon. But it's, <laughs> it's whatever God wants. Amen. So, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. I'm going to direct your attention to the first through the seventh verse. The word of the Lord said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, starting at verses one, at verse 1, it said, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them. Somebody needs to know that the God of this world is the devil. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 
verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but we preach Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I want you to pay attention right there to verse 6. It said to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what that tells us is, is that there is something that God either has allowed you to know. He has put something in you for you to learn, to know. Maybe you already know it. If you don't know it, he wants you to know it. But there is a light that shines in the darkness. Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost. There is a light that shines in the darkness that it, when, it, when it illuminates what it wants to illuminate, it will illuminate the knowledge of the Lord God Almighty. And we will begin to see what He has put in us and what He has made us to be. Now, verse 7. Let me take my text out of verse 7. Hallelujah. It said, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Let me read that again. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. If you had a neighbor, I would tell you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, there's something in you. And even if you didn't realize it or not, there's something in you. And even if you didn't know it or not, God put something in you. There is a reason why you are here. And there is a purpose for your life. He has put this treasure in earthen vessels. Oh God, I, I need to pray and get to the title. Because I'm going to get ahead of myself. Because I feel like preaching this afternoon. I, if I could... I want to preach to you from this topic. Now, keep in mind, it said we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Somebody look at your neighbor one more time and say, neighbor, it's in you. I want to preach to you on this subject. God's secret family recipe. God's secret family recipe. Would you pray with me? Father... I've come to you as humbly as I know how. I don't want milk today, but I want the meat of your word. We are no longer babies anymore, but we are growing up before you like a tree planted by rivers of water that shall not be moved. And we pray that you give us the meat of your word today. Father, I understand that you have an enormous task, but nothing's too big for you. You have to take a mere fallible man that is completely imperfect and try to form his lips to speak the already anointed word of God. But what I ask you today is to do only that, God, that you take this mere mortal man and that you would begin to form these lips to speak your already anointed word and to begin to speak the word that would set the captive free. And that would begin to speak the word that would cause somebody to understand what has been in them from the very foundation of the earth. And as I ask you now, every time I step behind this sacred desk, I pray, God, that you would preach me. Preach me, God, until somebody realizes that they are not alone. Preach me today, God, until somebody realizes that they are of value. Preach me today until somebody understands that you do not put people in this earth by accident or chance occurrence, but you do everything with a purpose and for a cause, and that we are only here to serve your purpose and your cause. And we pray, oh God, that you would speak, God, to us in a way that we could understand it, in a way that we could comprehend it, in a way that would change us 
in the name of Jesus. And we pray these things in your, your son's holy name. And the church would say, Amen. I'm going to preach this afternoon about God's secret family recipe. Since I have been old enough to remember, I can always remember the talk of folks throughout time discussing the way their family makes certain foods. If you can tell by looking at me, I like food. I like cake. I like food, really. I like it a lot. So I think that's why God uses uh, these type of illustrations because it's real easy for me to understand. <laughs> but I can always remember the talks of people throughout time discussing the way that their family makes certain foods. There have always been humorous debates about how one's family's recipe for a certain item is better than another recipe. Also, I can remember hearing people try another person's recipe for a certain food item. And when their taste buds were delighted in the flavor of that specific recipe, they would always ask, and I remember this very clearly, what do you put in this recipe? To which the chef may say, it's a secret family recipe. What was it that you put in that? Because it tasted differently than other times when I've tried this same dish. And then the chef would always say, it's a secret family recipe. I began to think lately that if we are created beings and God is indeed a creative God, that there had to be a recipe in us that brought us to life and that causes us to be who we are and ultimately what God has called us to be. The Bible said that He spoke the world into existence from absolutely nothing. He stood in darkness and He stood in nothing and He called those things that weren't as though they were. And I've come to tell somebody this morning or this afternoon, whatever it is, that He has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. He called you out of nothing into something. He called you out of obscurity into His marvelous light. And I began to think this week that if He made me and He called me, which I am completely aware that He did, that there had to be a recipe, a creative uh, ingredient that He put in each and every one of us that caused us to become and be what He has called us to be. You see, there are so many people in this hour and this day who believe that their life is nothing and that they are nothing and they are not valuable and that nobody cares about them. But I've come to tell somebody today that God has a secret family recipe and you, whether you realize it or not, are a part of His family. And before the foundation of the earth, before you were formed in your mother's womb, He made you and He made you in His image the way that He wanted you to be. He put every ingredient in you. He put everything that He wanted you to be how He wanted you to be. And He did it all at one time. And you are not a mistake. You are not an accident. You are the image of the living God spoken forth into existence by His all-powerful Word. So the difference today in God and in people is that people write down recipes. You'll find that. My grandmother was uh, very famous for that. She always had all of her recipes written down. But here's the difference in people and God. 
people write down recipes. God just speaks a word. And whatever he says becomes what he spoke it to be. Somebody hear me. I feel the spirit of the living God. God does not need to write anything down. God does not need to put a note on the pulpit to remember something that he needed to say. All he has to do is step out into nothing and begin to say something. And when he says something, everything changes. Somebody hear me. God reaches into nothing. God speaks into nothing. God Amen. takes nothing and he makes it something with just one word that proceeds out of his Amen. holy mouth. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost even even now. So now this brings me to our text because the Apostle Paul here, the writer of 2 Corinthians, he begins to speak about the gospel of Christ. Ah, somebody look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, there is a recipe and it's called the gospel. He begins to talk about the gospel of Christ. He speaks of it as it is something that can intentionally or, un or unintentionally, it can be hidden from those who must hear and see it. You see, there are a lot of things in the physical that we would like to cook and that we would like to taste, but it cannot taste the way that we want it to taste unless we have the right recipe. But there are some people that have those recipes and they won't share it because it's their secret family recipe. And so the, he speaks of the gospel today as if it's something that can either intentionally or unintentionally be hidden from those who must hear and see it. He speaks of blindness, which we know that Paul was very familiar with because Jesus knocked him off of his animal and caused him to become temporarily blind. He speaks of a darkness that only one light can illuminate. He speaks of knowledge that may or may not be understood as if it were possible that there were secrets. He talks about the gospel and he talks about mysteries and he talks about God as if there were things that are here in this word. But then there are things that we still have yet to learn and understand. And that maybe, just maybe, not everything can be taught to you in a Sunday school class or in a Bible study. But sometimes you have to be willing to have a certain experience if you want to have uh, the total embodiment of who God really is. Uh, they, 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 I, one of Some of my favorite preachers have always said this. They say some things cannot be taught. They must be caught. Amen. <laughs> so he speaks of knowledge that may or may, may not be understood as if it were possible that there were secrets. The light he speaks of though, he says, because God commanded that light to shine into the darkness, that light now illuminates the darkness. And the places where that knowledge may have been lacking, I want you to hear me. He said that Jesus, that God speaks into the darkness through Jesus. And he causes the places that used to be dark to become illuminated. That where there were mysteries and things that you may not have understood and that you had never seen. Now because of Jesus, you can come into the holy of holies and you can see what he has prepared for you. You can see the ingredients to what made this world and what made you to be what you are and what you are to be in the future. Ah, uh, we've spent so much time, church, only worrying about the outer court recipe. Can I tell you today that there is an outer court, there is an inner court, and there is a holy of holies. We have spent so much time in the outer court. And if you've never been to the outer court, if you've never seen how that recipe cooks up, yes, it's exciting. There's all kinds of things going on out there. There's all kinds of 
of excitement. There's all kinds of noise. There's all kinds of things going on in the outer court. But have you ever gotten so enamored with have you ever been able to shut off everything around you for just a minute and something in you cause you to wonder is there something beyond the outer court and I've come to tell you there is there is an inner court and when you get to the inner court I want you to know that there's something beyond the inner court there is this thing called the holy of holies and that is where the recipe uh, that is where everything that has ever been cooked up that is where everything that has ever been made or ever will be made that is where it goes to breed that is where it goes to be manifest that is where it goes to reveal to God's people what they are and what he has called them to be so today if there are areas that are lacking in your life I've come to tell you if there are darkness if there are areas that are obscure that God sent Jesus to this world. He robed himself in flesh and he became flesh so that that light could shine into darkness and it would illuminate all the mysteries of the knowledge that we needed to know. I want you all to hang out with me today. I'm going somewhere. But I've got to lay a foundation. So now, Paul talks about a treasure. Hear me today. Paul talks about a treasure that can be found in earthen vessels. Amen. The Bible says, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If we were in a group, I'd tell you to look at your neighbor, nudge him on the down low and tell him, neighbor... Did you know that you are the vessel? I want you to hear me today. Finally, talk, Paul starts to talk about this treasure that can be found in earthen vessels. But what we don't understand most of the time is, is that we are the vessel. We are the earth in vessel. But not only are we the vessel, but we are the vessel that he put the treasure in. We are the one that he put the recipe in. We are the one that he put the ingredients in. We are the vessel. Amen. So what strikes me though, is that this light and knowledge, it would seem to bring us all together as one family. And as a recipe creates a dish, God's word or his recipe for our lives that resides in us makes us who we ought to be. That while we may not be completely clear what those ingredients of this recipe are, we know that we are surely here. And I've come to tell you that it doesn't matter how you've arrived here, if you are here, if you have arrived here, it was not by chance occurrence. It was not by accident. But you are here on a divine appointment from the Holy Ghost. And I'm here on a divine assignment from the Holy Ghost to tell you that you are the vessel. And he put a earth and he put treasure in you. You are the vessel. And he put treasure in you. And you may not realize what it is. You may not realize what the ingredient is is yet but he has put you here to find out what it is so you can become what he called you to be somebody Amen. clap your hands and praise the Lord say Anthony I'm not very clear about what the ingredients are I'm not very clear about what it is that he put in me I've come to tell somebody that you don't have to be clear about what the ingredients are as of yet. You don't have to know everything that there is to know. You just have to know that you're here for a reason and that you are the vessel and that there is a treasure in you. And that if there is a treasure in you, the light will shine into the obscurity and into the darkness. And it will reveal to you what that treasure is. And it will cause you to become everything that God called you to be.
to be. God has a secret family recipe that I believe He is revealing in these last days that I would like to share with you. I've come today with the intensity and the desperation of a dying man to get somebody to understand that you are here for a purpose, that you are not an accident, that you were made in the image of God, that He made you for a purpose, that He had a recipe, a perfect recipe that He made, and He made you the way that He made you because you would serve a purpose. God Almighty. <clears throat> it was just recently that God revealed to me the truth of what holds everything together. You see, we have become preoccupied with the belief that God is working to reveal things in us that were never there. I want you to hear me today. The church has become preoccupied with the belief that God is working to reveal things in us that were never there. But I've come to tear that popular philosophy down. And I've come to tell somebody that God is not trying to reveal things in you that were never there. But He is trying to reveal things that have always been there. That have always been in you. That have always been a part of you. That have always been at the depths of your spirit. But you were just never aware of. God has not brought you to this moment. To reveal things to you. That were never in you. But God has brought you to this moment. To reveal things that he put inside you. From the very foundation of the earth. Before you are gleam in your daddy's eye. Before your mom and dad ever went on their first date, he knew you. Before they ever loved each other, before they ever got married, he knew you. Ah, I want somebody to understand this today, that your mom and dad were a vehicle to get you into this world. But they were not completely necessary. Because somebody hear me. Your mom and dad were a vehicle to get you into this world. But they were not completely necessary. Because if God ever spoke a word about you or about your life. Or he ever said anything about you. You hear me. He already put it inside of you. And it was for you to become what he called you to be. Even if it wasn't that mom and dad. It would have been another mom and dad. If it wasn't that that mom and dad, it would have been another mom and dad. You are here for a purpose. They were just a vehicle to get you here. Mm -hmm. He's not trying to reveal to us things that were never there. But God is trying to reveal things to us. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. That were already and have always been inside of you. Yes. There are people today who are listening that you say, you know what? I know I'm here and I know that I've made it this far, but I just don't know what it was that held it together. I don't know what ingredient it was that got me here. I don't know what it was. And I, all my life now I've been seeking to find things that I never thought were there. But what God is trying to do is He's trying to get His people to not seek things that were never there. But He's trying to get you to seek things that were always there. That have always been inside of you. I've come to awaken a sleeping giant in you. That you would realize all the power, all the anointing, all the glory that's already inside of you, child of God. Mm -hmm. When we bake a cake, I like cake, so I'll use that as an example. When we bake a cake, we put ingredients into that cake that once the cake is done baking, hear me, 
Once the cake is done baking, you cannot see those ingredients. But I've come to tell you today that if it were not for those ingredients, the cake would not be there. Hear me. Have you ever heard of something called an egg? Have you ever heard of something called oil? You put eggs and you put oil into a cake because it holds everything together. And then when the cake comes out of the oven, you can't see the eggs and you can't see the oil. But if you would not have put the eggs and you would not have put the oil, the cake wouldn't have held itself together. And I've come to tell somebody that there are things in you that now that you are a finished product, now that you have arrived at the place that you are, you don't see what it is that got you here. You don't understand how you got here. But what you do understand is, is I made it here somehow, some way. And I've come to tell you that there was some spiritual oil. The oil, the Holy Ghost, the anointing is what held you together. Even when you weren't living right. Even when you didn't give God what He was due. Even when you weren't worthy of the call. Even when you didn't do what He wanted you to do. He still held you together until you got it right. Woo! Hallelujah! Shikandayata! Woo! Glory! I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Oh God Almighty, I feel the Holy Ghost. Is there anybody that's ever been held together? I don't know about you, but when I look back over my life and I think things over, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? He held it all together. <laughs> oh God Almighty. I think about all the nights where I should be dead. I shouldn't be married today. I shouldn't have my beautiful wife. I shouldn't have the things that I have. I shouldn't have my job. I shouldn't have my car. I shouldn't be in church. I shouldn't be a preacher. I shouldn't be anything. But Jesus held it together. Oh God Almighty. The enemy doesn't want you to see it, church. But you're here today because Jesus held it all together. He tried to tell you that God didn't love you no more. He tried to tell you that God wasn't for you anymore. But you wouldn't even be here if it was not for Him. You wouldn't have made it this far if it was not for Him. Even though you cannot see the ingredients now, the ingredients still did their job. Woo! Hallelujah. I don't know about anybody else, but I feel like preaching now. Glory to God. Everyone has had or will have his own dry and fiery moments. When it feels like that we ourselves are even in the oven. When God's recipe seems to have led you to that hot and dry place where nothing grows. It's just hot and it's dry. But I want you to hear me today. I want you to hear me good. Please be aware today that when you arrive at that place where you say it's hot, it's dry. And nothing's growing. I want you to understand this is something that everybody goes through. This is called your desert season. And I want you to hear me today. Do not despise it. Watch me. Hear me in the Holy Ghost. Jesus himself was led away into the desert to fast. And to pray. But he was also led there to be tempted. This was Jesus' desert moment. It will be how you confront your desert moment. That will reveal what you are really made of. Hear me. It will be how you confront your moment in the desert. That 
will reveal what you are made of. Some of you don't realize it because you did not know that it was already in you. But I want you to hear me that God has already equipped you to go through the desert. He's already equipped you for your temptation. He's already equipped you for your moment that you think you cannot handle. He's already equipped you with everything that you ever need to be what he's called you to be. Amen. I hope I'm helping somebody because I, if I'm not helping anybody else, I'm helping myself. Good God Almighty. Matthew chapter number 4 verses 1 through 4 records this. Jesus' desert season and how he confronted the moment. Matthew chapter number 4 verses 1 through 4. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the desert and the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. What the old King James Version of the Bible meant was that after he fasted for 40 days, he was hungry. He was hungry for something that had been cooked. He was hungry for that old-fashioned recipe that only, <laughs> that only somebody that you know can cook the way that they cook it. He was hungry for something. And the Bible said that when the tempter came to him, the devil said to Jesus, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. I want you to hear me now. Watch. Watch how Jesus replies. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. <laughs> But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Bible says that he was hungry. So his flesh was weak. But it is here where the Lord teaches us. That even in those moments it is possible. That even if you're in the desert. You can learn and you can and will become what he has spoke you to be. If you realize that you should not live by bread alone. But we live by every word that proceeds out of the recipe or the mouth of God. We live by the word of God. We live and we move and we have our being in him. We are the recipe that God spoke into existence and we live by every word that proceeds out of his mouth. Somebody give God a praise in here. Woo! Hallelujah. <laughs> it is in recent and current circumstances that I believe that many have realized their magnified need for God. We have COVID. We have political unrest. We have wars and rumors of wars. Prices of everything's jacked up. Everything seems like it's going in the toilet. And now everybody is realizing, you know what? I think we need God. I think that we better call upon the Lord. And I am reminded of the scripture in Ecclesiastes when he said, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Then I will hear their land. Somebody hear me. It's time for the church to humble themselves. And we need to start praying again. Because if we do, Jesus is on the way. And he is going to heal our land. He is going to speak the recipe for healing. He is going to speak the recipe for deliverance. He is going to speak the recipe for restoration. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
We have thought at times that if only we can make God bigger, then he can fix and heal my tribulation. Mm -hmm. If only I could make God bigger, if only I could magnify him, maybe he might fix our current situation. The Bible says in Psalm 34, verses 3 through 8, I want you to hear me. Oh, magnify. Let me say it again. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked up unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. It was after further study that I realized that David in this psalm was not talking about magnification as we understand it. Obviously, when something is magnified, we make it bigger. But here's the problem. The Bible said, oh, magnify the Lord. So we were talking about God. The question is, is we're, if we're talking about God, how can I make God bigger? He is the God that fills all space and time. He is the God that is everywhere. He is the God that is here, there, and here. But all at, one, all at the same time, He is in the past. He is in the present. He is in the future. But He is there in all three places, all at one time. He is on my present. He is on my sin. He is everything all at one time, all at one season, all in one instance. So now the question arises. We need God to be bigger. But how can God be bigger? He's already the biggest God. He's already the greatest God. I'll take it a step further. There is no other God. Under Him, above Him, beside Him, beneath Him. He stands all by Himself. When people ask Him for a definition of who He is, He just says, I am that I am. He does not need to define Himself. He yes. fills all space and time. He is everything all at one time. Mm -hmm. So you say... David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. If God is already the biggest force in the universe, how is it that I can make him bigger? David's magnification here was not talking about the magnification of actually making something bigger. But the magnification that David was talking about here was like unto the magnification that we do when we put an item up under a microscope. <laughs> when we put an item under the microscope, the size of the item does not change, but how you perceive the item does. The size of the God does not change. But when your perception of Him changes, then He will move. The size of the God cannot be changed. But I've come to tell you that you can magnify Him. And the way that you magnify Him is allowing Him to transform your mind. That you can begin to perceive Him in a different light, in a different way. He is a great big God. And there there is a little, little devil out there. He's bigger than all your problems. He's bigger than your past mistakes. He's bigger than all of your problems. Your sickness, your disease, your infirmity. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Change your perception and see him differently. 
Ki karabaya taya la bahaya. If we would ever just come to the place where we could see him the way that he wants us to see him. We would begin to see his recipe for revival and for victory. God will change your perception to allow us to understand him better. So you can see him bigger and know what he has placed inside of you. When you change your perception, when you allow his spirit to transform you, you will begin to see the recipe that he put together for your life. And he will begin to cause you to walk in the fruition and walk in the things that he had already spoken about you from the very foundation of the earth. Here lately, God has begun to prick my heart. I've shared it with you on more than one occasion. But I've become so hungry for him that I am no longer concerned with the things that I used to be concerned about. I no longer care about the gas prices. I no longer care who's the president. I no longer care about what's going on in politics. I no longer care about anything in this life or this world. I just want to know Him. Amen. I believe God would have us to learn something about His family recipe. His family recipe is like this. The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. That means he lives in our praise. And everybody's running around saying, I wish I knew what the recipe for victory was. I've come to tell you today that it's in your praise. <laughs> I've heard it said lately that the most important part of the service at church is the preaching. But I beg to differ. And that's not a very healthy thing for me to say because I'm a preacher. But I beg to differ. The most important part of the service is the praise and worship. You see, the preaching that we do is a secondary consequence to men sinning. Mm -hmm. So because men sinned, now we have to preach. It was the foolishness of preaching that God chose to confound the hearts of men. Mm -hmm. So now God commands us to preach Amen. because men sinned. Now watch me. I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. Adam fell in the garden. He sinned. Mm -hmm. That's why we preach. Amen. But if Adam would have never fallen in the garden, God would have never commanded us to preach. Mm. But he still would have commanded us to worship. <laughs> he would have never commanded us to preach. But he still would have commanded us to worship and to praise his holy name. And I've come to tell you that we have church all messed up. We come and I hope my favorite preacher's preaching. And I hope they sing the songs that I want to hear. And I hope that they sing the songs that I like. And I hope and I hope and I hope 
But I've come to tell somebody, you don't go to church for you. You go to church for God. And as part of the secondary consequence, He blesses you. He loves you. He wraps you up in His arms. We don't go to church because we want to hear something uh, interesting. We don't go to church to see what we want to see. We go to church because we lift our hands and we raise our voice and we say, God, what do you want to hear today? What do you want to do today? What do you want me to preach today? Do you want me to preach or do you want me just to worship? What do you want me to do today? I hear God calling his church back to the place where they would come into his house and say, God, I'm not here to be entertained. I'm not here for the praise team. I'm not here for the preacher. I'm here for you. But but when you come into his presence and you praise him right I want you to hear me His recipe is so perfect His recipe is so awesome that when you come into his presence and you start to lift your hands and you say, God, I don't want you to heal me, but I know you're a healer. Yes, yes. I don't want you to bless me, but I know you're a blesser. Yes. I don't want you to give me money, but I know you own a cattle on a thousand hills. I don't want you to fix my marriage, but I know you can fix marriages. I don't want, I'm not asking you to give my church revival, but I know you are the God of revival. What happens as a secondary consequence of our right praise and worship? He, I want you to hear me that when you praise him, when you tell him that he's awesome, when you tell him that he's lovely, when you tell him that he's a healer, when you tell him that he's a blesser, it's impossible for him not to bless you. It's impossible for him not to heal you. It's impossible for him not to put your marriage and your church and your home back together. Because when you come to him correct, his recipe is perfect. <sighs> Woo! God Almighty. Is there anybody that's listening to me today that's hungry? Is there anybody that's hearing this word today? You say, you know what? Anthony, I'm tired. I'm tired of just having church the way that we've always had church. I'm tired of getting two or three songs. And I'm tired of getting my word and then going home. And most of the time I go back the same exact way that I came. I want to come into his presence. And I want to touch his tangible anointing. And as a result of touching his tangible anointing, because I learned to praise and worship him correctly, as a result of that, I do not return to my house the way I came. I don't return to my job the way that I came. I don't return to my marriage the way that I came. I don't return to anything the way that I came. Because when you come into contact with his anointing, it's impossible to not change. It's impossible to not leave with a mark on your life. Mm -hmm. I've got to wrap it up. But I want you to hear this. Oh, God Almighty. If we do not hear or learn anything else about God's secret family recipe, Please let us learn this very last principle that I want to share. Hear me. God's ingredients are eternal and they are overriding. God's ingredients are eternal and they are overriding. 
right over there in my kitchen, I have some items that you can use in a recipe for food. But if you let them sit in the cupboard for too long, they'll go bad and they will expire. I've come to tell somebody today that God's ingredients never expire. Amen. His recipes never go bad. His way is always good. His ingredients are eternal and overriding. Frankly, it does not matter what we have done. It does not matter what we have said. It does not matter what you have thought. Even if what you've done, said, or thought has added ingredients to God's recipe. Because His ingredients are eternal and they are overriding. We ourselves can never change how the final product tastes. Somebody hear me. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how many people you've slept with. It doesn't matter how many drugs you've done. It doesn't matter how many, how uh, the bottom of every bottle that you've ever been to. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done. There is nothing that you can ever do to change what God said about you. There is nothing that you can ever do to change His ingredients. There's nothing that you can ever do that can change how He feels about you. He loves you. Woo! God, He loves us. Amen. He does. He didn't have to love me, but he loves me. Mm -hmm. Woo! Nothing that I ever did, not one drug, not one alcohol, not one sexual partner, not one thing ever changed the way that he feels about me. The Bible says that the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. You know what that means? Is that if he ever spoke a word about your life, which he did, or you wouldn't be here. If he didn't speak a word over your life, you wouldn't be here. So if you're here, he did speak a word. So if he ever did speak a word, he's not sorry. And it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't change anything. He can restore you today. And God's definition of restoration is not like men. Men will try to help you to get the glory. God will lift you up and he will make you better than you were before you fell. Yes. Somebody hear me. His ingredients are eternal and they are overriding. And we ourselves can never change how the final product should taste. Wow. What we have become as of now does not appear to us to be anything that resembles what it would seem that God had planned or had in store for my life. Because he is eternal and because his ingredients are overriding, it does not change how he sees me. It does not change how he sees you. Because he is eternal and he is overriding, he only sees what he had originally spoke, no matter how you are now. He can only see you as he spoke you. He spoke you into existence before the foundation of the earth. And it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, or how far that you went down. He can only see you the way that he spoke you because his word, his recipe, his ingredients are eternal and they are overriding. So now, God's secret family recipe, we come to understand now is Jesus and him in us. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles. Which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Somebody needs to know this today. Jesus is the recipe and he is the hope for glory. Amen. I have let the proverbial cat out of the bag now. I have told the secret family of mess recipe. This mystery is Christ and Him in us. And because of that ingredient, there is hope of glory to those who really want to know Him. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18 said, Seeing then that we have such hope, look, Christ in us, the hope of glory. I'm done right here, I promise you. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. 
Seeing then that we have such a hope. Seeing then that we have Jesus. The ultimate ingredient. The best part of the recipe. We use great plainness of speech. Not as Moses would put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil and taken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Somebody will hear me. He's going to take the veil away. And he's going to let you see the recipe. He's going to see. He's going to let you see the ingredients. He is going to let you see what he's cooking. Mm -hmm. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. God's secret family recipe is present and it is in you to change you. You may not see it clearly today, but you will understand it when the recipe has changed you from the inside out. When God removes the veil... When he opens the pages of his cookbook and he says, this is the secret. This Jesus, this Jesus is the secret ingredient. He is the recipe Amen. to life. I'm finished. I went too long as I always do. I'm sorry. I've become an anointing addict. Whenever the anointing is there, I can't stop. If there's anybody today that's here that you have a need, I want you to stretch your foot, hands toward the camera. Stretch your hands toward me and we're going to pray. We're going to pray, God, that not because of what He does, but because of who He is and because we have learned to love Him for who He is. That signs, miracles, and wonders would follow His Word. Because we have prayed to Him and asked Him for the meat of His Word and not the milk. He will come through and He will give us what we have need of. If we have approached His throne correctly. Stretch your hands forth and let's pray. Father, I bless you and I love you and I glorify you with everything that's in my heart, mind, and spirit. I thank you for this word today and I pray that every person that's watching me right now that has a need in their body that they would realize that you are the secret recipe. You are the ingredient to life that we need, that we hold dear and that we need so badly in our life. That we would realize that if we could just want you, God, as a secondary consequence to how badly we want you, we would get all the things that we need accomplished. God, I pray that we would begin to seek you with an open heart and that we would seek you, God, with our whole minds and our whole bodies and our whole spirits. God, that we would not forsake one thing, but that we would give you everything that is due to your name because you are so worthy. Worthy. I pray, God, that as a secondary consequence of the desperation and the passion that your people feel today, that you would begin to send your spirit, send your power, and send your glory to them even now. Let signs, miracles, and wonders begin to occur right now. Financial situations are drying up in the name of Jesus. Sickness, disease, and infirmity are drying up in the name of Jesus. Problems, circumstances, and situations are drying up in the name of Jesus. God is healing marital situations. God is healing financial situations. God is taking care of everything that His faithful people need Him to take care of. If you only believe that He is the recipe. That He is the secret family ingredient. He is the ingredient that holds us all together. He's doing it even now. Somebody believe it. Believe it. Believe it. Believe it. Even now He's doing it. Thank you Jesus. Oh God. If you have prayer requests. Throw them in the comments. DM me. Send me a uh, 
send me a text message. There are miracles happening right now. I want you to hear this. There are miracles happening right now, not because of me, but because of obedience. God is using this ministry. God is using other ministries. He is releasing the anointing into the atmosphere mm -hmm. and into the lives of His people even now. In the name of Jesus. Oh God, if you have those needs, send them, send them, send them in the comments. Send them in my DMs. Text me. We're praying for you every Saturday. I see you. I see you. I know He is. I know He is. He is working miracles. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. God Almighty, thank you, God, that you are not a God that you should lie, nor the Son of Man that you should repent. But when your people who are faithful, they call upon you, you hear their cries, and you answer them from your holy hill. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, I love you. I pray that you have a good week. Monday's coming. Get ready. Just remember what the ingredients are to the secret family recipe. And if you remember what the ingredients to the secret family recipe is, everything's going to be okay. Because as long as I got King Jesus, everything is going to be all right. As long as you keep him in your heart, everything is going to be all right. I love you. I'm praying for you. And I pray, God, that he would release blessings and miracles into your life. There's so much that you don't even have room enough to receive what he's about to. Let there be overflow. In the name of Jesus, I'm going even now in the name of Jesus. God bless you. We are gone.